Illegal procedures are a cornucopia of almost random penalties. These are technical infractions, meaning non-contact penalties against the opposing team. Some of these are common, and some of these are rarely seen. Since these don't have a binding theme like the other rules, I'm going to try to group them together to make them a little more coherent, which means if you're following along in the rules, you'll be bouncing around a little bit, although it is still going to, and there's no way around it, be a bit of a laundry list and sometimes a bit random. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The date of this recording is March 8, 2015, and there have been no modifications since the initial presentation was recorded. Let's start with some of the most common reasons for illegal procedures, and one that I can most easily group together. Illegal procedures involving the penalty box. The following items get, along with the illegal procedure and hand signal, the verbal cue of penalty box violation. By the way, many of these can now, at the discretion of the head referee, be called by the NSOs instead of just recommended. Leaving the penalty box before time expired but no penalty if the skater was incorrectly told to leave, only if the skater did it of her own volition. If the skater leaves the penalty box during a timeout. Entering the penalty box to communicate with a penalized skater, unless that person is authorized medical personnel and is only communicating with the skater about medical matters. On this last issue, I want to elaborate a little bit further. Entering the box is not communicating. If a player gets a penalty for not having their number on their arm and someone else enters the box, hands them a marker and leaves but says nothing, that is not a penalty. If that person steps outside the box and starts talking to the penalized skater, that is not a penalty. Inside the box, cone of silence. Outside, they can do dramatic readings if they wish. If the violation does happen, but the person entering the box to communicate isn't a skater, then the penalty goes to the team captain. If a player is in the penalty box and removes safety equipment other than the mouth guard, that penalty gets the verbal cue of equipment violation. Adjusting equipment isn't to be penalized, but can the equipment be taken off to be adjusted? No, they cannot. If the equipment needs to be removed, the skater can go to her bench after serving her penalty and then fix it, or remove herself from play completely after her penalty time has expired. But the penalty box is considered part of the track, and the safety equipment must stay in place. I'm going to go slightly off topic and remind you that removing safety equipment anywhere on the track is an equipment violation penalty. The mouth guard is an exception in the penalty box, but not anywhere else. Likewise, if the mouth guard is not properly in place, that is an equipment violation penalty. If a player dislodges their mouth guard, yes, even if it's still in their mouth, it is a penalty. There are several items that get put in with the illegal reentry verbal cue. In rule sets past, they were similar, but not quite like cutting the track. Now they're just like cutting the track, such as returning from the penalty box in front of an opposing blocker or two blockers from their own team, or being waved off from the penalty box and returning in front of an opposing blocker or two blockers from their own team. I've seen this question a few times. What is the difference between being in front of all the blockers and being behind all the blockers? If someone enters in front of everyone, 
are they in reality really, really far behind them? For this delineation, we use the engagement zone. If someone re-enters the track inside the front end of the engagement zone, they're in front of all the blockers and get a penalty. If that person re-enters the track ahead of the engagement zone, they're really, really behind the rest of the skaters. This isn't a penalty box item, but it's so close to the last thing I just talked about. I want to make sure that it's next on our laundry list. Someone who has left the track to correct an equipment issue must re-enter the track behind all other in-play skaters, just like if they left the penalty box. I stress equipment because if they left to correct a medical issue, they're done for that jam and cannot re-enter, even if they appear or insist that they are fine. Another common issue is too many skaters on the track. Time was that we'd have to wait for the jam to start and then tell the extra skater to leave. Now that it's not a penalty unless there's impact upon the jam, it's perfectly okay to inform the team before the jam starts that they have an extra skater. Even if the jam is underway, if you can get that extra skater off the track, and this time you can pick a skater, preferably the extra one, or if you don't know, then make the best guess. If you can do that without it causing major impact upon the jam, do so. If there is major impact, call the jam and issue the penalty to the extra skater. Likewise, if there are too many pivots on the track, inform the extra pivot that there are too many pivots and that she must remove her helmet cover. Remember that the full title of a pivot is pivot blocker, and as long as there's still a legal number of blockers on the track, extra pivot included, then that pivot is allowed to remain on the track. If you can't get the not quite a pivot to remove her helmet cover after repeat attempts, you can issue an insubordination penalty, but be sure that all reasonable attempts have been made to communicate with that skater first. As far as which pivot gets told to remove her helmet cover, any pivot in the penalty box from the previous jam must remain a pivot. If there are two lined up for the jam, it's the one closest to the referee making the request. If there are multiple referees about to make that call, be aware of who's closest and who's most likely to have that cover removal order complied with. Related to too many skaters on the track is too many skaters or bench staff in the team area. This is a bench staff violation and goes to the pivot if it happens during a jam or the captain if between jams or if there's no pivot. Medical staff are generally not considered to be bench staff and so are stationed away from the team areas unless they're needed. They can be in the team area to treat an injured skater, but only during that time. If a team has their own doctor and want that doctor on the bench during the game, then he or she must be one of their designated bench staff. From here, let's go into the sometimes confusing world of false starts and illegal positioning. False starts are pretty common. These are when a skater is fully inbounds, but in an illegal starting position. Legal starting positions are, for pivots, anywhere between the pivot and jammer lines, including on, but not ahead of, the pivot line. For jammers, it's anywhere on or behind the jammer line. For blockers, it's anywhere between the jammer and pivot lines, and not on them at all. Being on the line, but having part of the skate or body touching in front of the line counts as a false start. If a pivot is touching the pivot line, all of the other blockers must be behind that pivot's hips. Or if both pivots are touching the line, the hips of the furthest behind pivot. Jammers cannot be accelerating at the jam start lest they get a false start call. They can be moving, just not accelerating. Some jammers may try to time themselves against the five second call from the jam timer. So if you're the jammer referee, be cognizant of what's happening as that jam starts. In the event that a skater false starts, they are given a false start warning. It's called almost like any penalty with color number false start except that there's no whistle and no swoop of the hand. I still see some veteran skaters go to the penalty box when given the warning because it used to be a penalty. Bring them back to the track if possible. 
if they're bound and determined to sit 30 seconds, well, don't let your other duties lapse because the skater has taken your false start warning as a penalty and isn't paying attention to your return to the track instructions. The same applies for jammers who have false started when there's no other jammer on the track. They should stop and give up the time they picked up because of the false start. In both cases, after that momentary pause, that false starting skater can legally resume. It's also worth mentioning that if a jammer legally yields her false start but has already passed an opponent, that pass does not count. The legal yield makes it a no pass, no penalty, and that jammer will have to repass that player or players in order to be awarded lead jammer. Illegal positioning is similar to false starting, except that the skater has lined up completely out of their starting area. A blocker or pivot completely behind the jammer line or in front of the pivot line, or a jammer completely in front of the jammer line is in an analegal position. There is no warning for this. It's a penalty as soon as that jam begins. Should all of the team's blockers be illegally positioned, do not start the jam. Call an official timeout and issue a delay of game penalty to the captain, not an illegal procedure. If a pack cannot be defined due to skater or skater's false starting, because false starting players cannot be considered part of the pack until after they have yielded, then if the pivot is false starting, give the penalty to the pivot immediately or the skater closest to the referee. In this case, there's no opportunity to yield. There's no technical term for this, but if there were, I would hope it would be something along the lines of shenanigans. And since we're talking shenanigans, let's talk about skaters who intentionally take a position as to delay their team's ability to start or reform a pack at jam start. The descriptions given in the rules are starting on their back or a group of skaters starting in a dog pile. But those are examples and not items that we're limited to. In this case, the actual verbal cue is stalling. The next item I want to cover isn't a shenanigan, but something that brings up a very common question regarding the illegal call-off penalty. If the error came from the referee, why is the jammer penalized for successfully calling off the jam when she's not the lead jammer? It's a good question, and one that I can't answer, although I can speculate. My speculation is that it's there to prevent people from trying to make it a tactic. But let's be clear, this is a referee mistake, and one that we should feel bad about having to issue. But for the sake of anyone new watching this, or God forbid just did this, I think it's something that we've all done. I certainly have. The most common times for this are lack of experience or lack of concentration. If it happens to you, find out why it happened and how you can correct it. It may be something you have to do after the game, but find the time. It's also worth mentioning that if a jammer referee is pointing at the jammer, she is effectively a lead jammer. And that includes even if the other jammer has already been declared the lead jammer. It's been said many times before that a referee's job isn't to coach, but instead to convey factual information. If a jammer referee is pointing at the jammer in the you're the lead jammer way, then that skater has every right to expect that she is the lead jammer and can call off the jam. This penalty should only be issued if she is not being pointed at, and the jam is still called because of her call-off. As we start winding down, we're going to get a little bit more random, and with that in mind, let's move into uniform violations. This is simply listed in Rule 5.13.13 .13 as improper uniform, jewelry, or skates. For the details of this, you actually want to go to rules 2.7, 2.8, and 2.9. I won't go into all the details, but here's a quick list of things to know. Safety pins and tape are verboten when it comes to attaching numbers. Tape is allowed elsewhere as long as it's not dangerous, but can't be used as numbers. 
Pins are never allowed anywhere. Jewelry? It must be safe. Skates? Quad skates? Not in lines. Let's start to wrap this up with foul outs and expulsions. If a skater has fouled out, she is allowed to return to the spectator portion of the event. However, if she goes beyond expected behavior from an audience member, her captain is given a penalty with a verbal cue of interference. Likewise, an expelled skater failing to leave the track or returning to the track area, even the spectator area after that expulsion, also garners the captain an interference illegal procedure penalty. Should either of these situations happen, I highly suggest that you let the captain deal with it. Especially if there was a prior expulsion, there's a good chance that the skater may not be amenable to your demanding additional actions. The captain, on the other hand, still has a game to play and may be better able to get control of the player. Explain to the captain beforehand that she is going to get the penalty for that skater's action. The last thing you want to do is reward the captain for a job well done with a trip to the penalty box. Make sure she's fully aware of the process. Something along the lines of, when Black 123 came back onto the track, that causes another penalty. But because she has already been expelled, that means technically it's your penalty. I have to send you to the penalty box because of it, but before you go, do you think you could get her back to the staging area? It may sound corny, but you have very little leverage to force that other skater off the track except to start racking up penalties, fouling out the captain, plus however many more captains they have to run through before they run out of skaters. The rules say the captain has to serve the penalty because of the behavior of their subordinate skater. But first, let the captain be the captain. You may have noticed that I haven't touched star passes yet. There's a good reason for that. Star passes are full of complications and procedures, and it's just too much to put into this cornucopia of miscellaneous rules. I'll be putting together a separate presentation just on star passes and the nuances, rules, and penalties surrounding that. But I can talk briefly about non-star pass related helmet covers. Helmet covers cannot be removed by anyone except the designated skater in that position, teammate or opponent. The only exception is that a player can remove an extra helmet cover from a teammate, such as if a team has more than one person wearing a pivot or a jammer cover. In these cases, there's really not a specified verbal cue. Star pass violation isn't the case. You could go with uniform violation for if a teammate takes the cover illegally, but I'd stick with just a legal procedure for an opponent, unless it happened as part of an attempted star pass which, as I said, is a whole different presentation. Also, if a cover falls to the ground or is removed from play, only those same designated players can retrieve the cover. Thank you for sitting through this long list of penalties. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, in many ways this is a laundry list of randomly collected penalties. You could say it's a catch-all location for non-contact penalties that really don't fit in the other sections. But they do come into play, sometimes frequently, sometimes hopefully never. But they are there for a reason, and I hope this presentation was able to help you with your learning and understanding of them. I'd like to thank Preflash Gordon for permission to use his photographs in this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.